Sometimes mixing can feel like a game of whack-a-mole. A few special tricks, techniques, some processes that you've learned to fix one problem and then a new problem arises. And typically, these little issues get pushed all the way down the line and as a mastering engineer, I'm the one experiencing and hearing them and having to navigate or either educate my clients on. So in this video, I'm going to take you through 13 techniques which are destroying your masters. I'm going to split this video into two halves. The first six techniques I'm going to show you are going to be specifically to production and mixing techniques people are doing poorly. And the final set of these techniques and productions are going to pertain to mastering techniques people try out, which tend to destroy the sound of their masters. First production or mixing technique, which is destroying your masters, is cutting the low end from every element but the kick and the bass. Now, using a high pass filter, there is a use case for that. When a particular production element, signed as an element, recorded channel comes in, and there is an excess in that particular channel of a low frequency, which isn't conducive to the mix. Yes, use a high pass filter, cut those low frequencies out. However, doing it blanketly across all your mix, except on your kick and your bass, there isn't a net benefit and there may actually be a net negative in the sound of your mix. The reason being is typically a well-produced, a well-arranged, a well-recorded set of material for mixing, the sum of those low frequencies will be so low that it shouldn't necessarily impede on the clarity of the kick and the bass. Now, let's talk about the processing itself. When you're using an equalizer or a high pass filter, that is the sum or the sum of a phase rotation that is happening in the low frequencies in order to cause that cancellation or that attenuation in the low frequencies. So you're actually introducing some unnecessary processing to a signal if it doesn't necessarily need that in the first place. And what we want in to have really good masters or really great mixes. So knowing when and how to use your tools is super important. So no, you don't always need to use a high pass filter on everything but the kick and bass. The second mixing habit, more so than a technique, it's a habit people strive towards is to have everything perfectly clear at the forefront. Now, the reality is music is rarely, really ever composed or arranged like that. There are elements which are meant to take the foreground, the melody, the rhythm. There are certain elements which are going to poke out and capture the listener and other ones that are going to be supportive. And yes, sometimes certain elements will sit further back and be a little bit harder to distinguish, but that's what creates interest in the mix. That's what creates an exciting master is using depth to the advantage of the production, to the experience of the listener. So no, not every Everything has to be louder than everything else. The third one I find, especially with mixes coming in for mastering, is people who are using excessive low ends, okay? The fundamental of your kick, it's good to give it a little bit of a boost when you need a bit more energy, but a lot of people, sometimes it can be due to their monitoring environments, tend to overdo it. So my thing would be here is make sure you're listening to your mixes on outside systems, systems with subs in your car, on your hi-fi system, in the living room. Get an idea for what those boosts are actually doing and how it's interacting with your final mix. The fourth one has to be cutting too much low end from the snare. It's one of my biggest pet peeves because I'm a huge fan of big fat six and a half inch snares which just fucking hit you straight in the chest now a lot of people like cut out the low mids that's where the mud is but with snare drums that's where the thickness is that's where the fat is that is where the weight of it is yes the snaps in the top end that crack that snaps through the the mix but the impact is in those low mids you're 200 to 400 hertz try to Get a feel for how much you really need to be cutting if you're cutting any at all. Because I find a lot of mixes come in for mastering and it's just those low mids are completely gone away in the snare and that energy is just completely killed. The fifth production technique, mixing technique. Now this is more a bit of care and nuance and something a lot of more experienced mixing engineers develop over time. And that's knowing how far to process your vocals, how to really treat the vocals with a lot of respect. Um, what I find with mixes starting out is that they tend to over-process their vocals. They tend to over-compress, over-saturate, uh, over-add more effects than necessary. And then you can hear excessive sibilance and distortion, and it feels a little bit hollow and 
the vocals typically, especially with pop arrangements, is where the energy of the music is. And if you're over-processing it and doing it to the detriment of the music, well, then your master isn't going to hold up because that's one of the core elements of that music translating to a listener and giving them a full experience as the music was intended to. The sixth one is narrow mixes. Now, wide mixes, that could be another issue all in itself, but more often than not, I find narrow mixes are really because people aren't exploring the full breadth of tools they have available. And by tools, I mean simple tools like panning, okay? You can pan elements and, and people know this, but sometimes they get a little bit afraid to because it can feel a little bit jarring just having an element off to one side, but you can be creative with it. You can have a guitar on the left-hand side and then send the reverb out to the right or a delay out to the right and start to create some depth and movement and texture throughout the actual mix itself. So narrow mixes is, is one thing I feel kill masters um, simply because there's very little we can do in mastering once it does come through to us to cohesively spread that stereo field and how far we can take it before other elements start to break apart. Now, mastering techniques. Mastering techniques which I feel are destroying your masters. The first one has to be elliptical filters or just simply monoing the low end. Now, unless a mix really, like, I've, I've heard some mixes where there is, like, a huge fundamental in the kick out to one side of, like, really hard panned onto one side of the stereo field. Yes, I'll use an elliptical filter in those cases. But blanketing an elliptical filter across all your masters can really kill some of the energy that's naturally in the sound design. It's something, it's a tool that can be used to great effect when it's needed, when there's an issue, when there's something to be corrected. However, if there's nothing to be corrected in the stereo field and there's just a little bit of stereo width in the low end, there's nothing wrong with that. You don't need to use an elliptical filter and kill everything there because a lot of those, uh, a lot of the phase relationship between the left and the right is also sometimes, especially in modern productions and modern sound design, inherent in the tone of those bass lines, of those synths, of those 808s. The next technique is cutting out the low end for more headroom. Now, Yes, if the low end is it's super excessive and chewing up so much space that it's going to destroy the final result of the master. Yes, that's why we have high pass filters. That's why we can cut out that low end. However, using it as a blanket thing to drive a signal is not always the case because when you're actually using a steep filter on the low end, let's say 35, 40 hertz, and there's another fundamental or another element in the low end of the mix that is crossing over there, often that filter will cause a peak that is higher than the original peak and you actually lose headroom more than you gain. So yeah, just be careful about when and how you use filters on a blanket statement in terms of people say that you must do this because often it's not the case. It's really not the case. Those tools are for specific circumstances to be used. You just can't blanket it across all masters because you will end up destroying your masters inevitably at some point or another. The third one is compressing because you think you need to. Okay, not every mastering session I jump into, I'm opening up a uh, TDR Katelnikov or dialing in my Verimu because I feel like I need to compress in mastering. The idea of compression in mastering is because there's something inherently that needs to be changed in the microdynamic or macrodynamic information of the mix. If a mix comes in and the dynamics are spot on, well, I don't need to make any changes or embellishments to that dynamic composition. I can leave it as it is. So you don't need to compress whenever you're mastering. It's a tool there, it's available for you to use, but don't feel the need to do it because I hear so many good mixes get destroyed from over compression because they just didn't need to be compressed in the first place. Now, I talked about narrow mixes. Now, the next one is wide masters where people try and over add too many widening plugins or processing to their masters and it ruins the energy. It sort of warps the perception of that original mix. Be very careful when using widening plugins, especially in mastering. Um, if you're confused about the way anything's sort of sitting, level match, A, B it. You know, if you have to listen to it back in mono, listen to the side signal, make sure those tones are matching up fairly because I, yeah, it's it's just sort of one thing I hear. I, I literally heard a mix this morning where I heard the master, somebody, like, somebody asked me to, like, what do you think of this master? And I heard it and I'm like, oh, there's something weird going on there. Did you use this widening plugin? And they're like, yeah. 
I did. And I'm like, okay, level match it, uh, bring it down 3.6 dB and, and now tell me what you think. And they're like, oh, wow, that's actually not doing what I wanted it to do. So yeah, winding plugins can destroy your masters. The next mastering technique, which is destroying people's masters is actually the tool itself. And that is using multiband compressors that don't have linear phase crossovers. Now, an example of a compressor with linear phase crossovers would be something like Leapwing Dyne 1 or the multiband compressors in Isotope Ozone Advanced. Um, perfectly phase coherent crossovers, they can null test. However, they're multiband compressors like OTT, where there are clear 180 degree phase rotations at the crossover points, and they won't null. They will warp the, and change the tone of your mix just inherently be, by being engaged. So even if they're doing absolutely nothing, no processing, just running the signal through it, and then it's splitting the bands and then re-summing the bands together with phase, phase rotation at those crossover points will degrade your signal. So make sure if you're using multiband processes, you're using good quality or linear phase crossover filtered multiband processes. The next thing which is destroying your masters is not using oversampling on clippers, dynamic processes, or limiters. Now, most mastering grade dynamic processes have internal oversampling. Most clippers or saturators will have an option for high quality or oversampling. Use that because you're inevitably using these processes and they're introducing a form of harmonic distortion, which are new frequencies that are added into the content of the signal, um, which are harmonic with the original signal. So either in degrees of second, third, or fourth order harmonics, which are just simply a doubling of octaves or tripling of octaves. And those are little subtle new frequencies which are brought into the signal. And that's cool. But as soon as those new frequencies fall outside of the bandwidth of your sample rate, they're folded back down as inharmonic content known as aliasing distortion. And that is inharmonic, it doesn't sound good. The way to get around that is to use oversampling, which opens up the bandwidth of the processor before folding it back down. So it's just a small little thing, but when you are using dynamic clipping, saturation, limiters, use oversampling. Use about four times oversampling, that's more than enough bandwidth for most domestic, like just normal commercial applications in mastering. That's what I use at least. Um, but yeah, but you, you don't want to not use oversampling when you're introducing any form of harmonic saturation, even if it's as subtle as something as using a limiter. And finally, I want to conclude this with something that are destroying people's masters is not being flexible in their approach, not expanding their knowledge, not considering new options, new alternatives. Now, as a mastering engineer for me, I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate with a lot of peers around me, having had good support as an engineer, getting into this game and the people I've sort of been privilege to meet over my time. Um, something I, I've always done is read. I've loved uh, Ethan Wine as the audio expert. I've read that multiple times. Bob Katz is mastering audio. Ooh, ooh, I got a bit excited. Smack the um, space button on a mix there. Um, uh, Bob Katz is mastering audio, another great book. And I've done that for the last eight years. I've, I've read many, many books. I've engaged with many, many peers, many professionals. And it's been a blessing. So I've always been able to adjust and learn and try new things. Now, where am I going with this? Well, I did, this is like a little mini plug for myself. I put together a course with EDM Prod for producers. Now, this is for producers wanting to learn mastering for electronic dance music. And if it's something you're interested in, there's a link in the description below. Um, by far, I think it's probably one of the best courses, if I even say so myself, on mastering, simply because the team at EDM Prod really care about the product, which means they supported me in developing it to, to the full extent. And also now it's in the market, we're really supportive of the students there as well, making sure they get the most support they need in engaging with the content and developing their understanding and knowledge of what's presented. So with that, I want to leave you with leave a comment in the section below with any notes you might have, any thoughts you might have about what's discussed in this video. Um, feel free to hit the like button, share and subscribe. And until next time, take care.